So the first gay person I loved was my father. And the second gay person I loved was Greg Bear. Right there, my friend. And I knew he was gay before he did. Yes, you did. And I've shared moments with this man where I've laughed so hard that no sound is coming out of our mouth. So that's the kind of history we have together. We worked together at a summer camp. And I, I had the, the good fortune of watching Greg uh, come of age and, and really have the courage to be himself. Um, and so I could not be more proud to introduce him tonight. So I want to share you a with you a little bit about Greg and what's happened with his life in the past 36 years since I first met him and we were just college students. Two years old. Pardon me? Two years old. <laughs> right. So Greg Baird is a national lecturer on LG, LQB, oh, these letters, LGBTQ, this is a different order for me, civil rights and equality. He's also a storyteller, and I can assure you that he is a very good storyteller, writer and filmmaker, and he has a dedicated following and social media that follows his life, act, his activism, daily quotes, and history facts, and the occasional cooking picture. He's a native of Michigan, which is where I met him, and he calls Petoskey his home, which is a very special place for both of us. And he's been an activist for LQBTQ issues for 27 years. His mission is to bring communities across the USA to a more accepting, place for everyone regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, sex, disability, gender identity, or sexual orientation. In 2008, Greg was the executive producer of a documentary about the gay hate murder of University of Wyoming college student Matthew Shepard. On October 12th of this year, it will be 19 years. 19 years since that hate crime took place and took Matt's life. Greg often lectures on that and students performing in the Laramie Project. He is also acknowledged for his contribution to Dr. Ruth Westheimer's book on her guide to college life and is written about in Lillian Colburn's book, The Green Room, A Mother's Truth. Greg was part of an Emmy Award winning LXTV NBC Universal lifestyle show called First Look and many of us have seen that wonderful show. Greg was interviewed as part of the show that featured Connie Dubai spending a night in the town with the Windy, Windy City celebrity. The summer of 2010, he was a keynote speaker at the International Lesbian Gay Police Association Gay Officers Action League of Chicago Conference. Greg, along with, with actress Sharon Gless from the hit show TV show Cagney and Lacey and Showtime's Queerest Folks were headliners at the Palmer House Hilton speaking about a British to unity. So I'm so proud to share with you the love of my life, <laughs> Greg. So first off, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming who made it possible to be here. And coming from Chicago, I almost felt guilty that we were having incredible blue skies and weather, and you were going through a horrific hurricane. And um, it being uh, a big-hearted guy, and I had friends down here I, I, I love dearly, and my brother and my dad are down here, and just the general human population to sit back and watch what was going on uh, brought a lot of anxiety. Um, for me and praying for the best. So I hope a lot of you uh, have fared well. Um, I appreciate it. it's just recently you went through a lot of cleanup and damage control and a lot of other things that I don't even, I've never experienced. So on behalf of me, um, I appreciate you being here and all the work that everybody has done 
uh, to get me here. So, so why Southwest Florida? Why, why am I here? Well, uh, first off, uh, I first started coming down to see my father, who is in Punta Gorda, uh, currently living with my brother in Orlando. And uh, then I found out Pat was down here, and I started meeting her friends, who became my friends, and I offered uh, to help with this event and uh, come here. So this is my first time in Southwest Florida to be speaking instead of sunning and cocktailing and having an occasional burger or fish and chips or something. So anyway, thank you for your time. I'd like to start off, um, I'm really big uh, talking about LGBT history. Uh, it's not teach in our schools. And if you follow me on Facebook, you'll know that I do a lot of trivia stuff. And today is the beginning of National LGBTQ History Month. So I'm going to give you a couple of facts before I start, and uh, maybe some of the allies may, may not even know uh, some of this stuff, or maybe it, how you identify, you may not know this either. So but in 1971, Connecticut became the second state after Illinois, yay, um, to decriminalize same-sex acts between consenting adults. In 1982, on this day, former Los Angeles Dodger outfielder Glenn Burke comes out uh, on Inside Sports. Anybody know who that is? Mm -hmm. Just heard the name. Yeah. See, you can tell I'm very sports minded. Yeah. Uh, becoming the first professional baseball player to do so. And in 2009, uh, Nevada domestic partnership becomes effective. Uh, LGBT History Month, LGBTQ History Month originating in the United States, was the first celebrated in 1994, founded by a Missouri high school history teacher, Rodney Wilson. It's also National Bullying Prevention Month. October 19th is LGBTQ Spirit Day. And, um, very hard here, it's, it'll be the 19th anniversary, I hate saying anniversary, the 19th um, uh, observance that Matthew Shepard was killed on a fence in Laramie, Wyoming, which I have a personal story I can share later, later about that. Um, and also on October 28th, uh, 2009, of October, of course, uh, Barack Obama signs the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act into law. So, a lot of stuff happened in October. So first off, um, I want to tell you that I brought some special people with me, and this is my family. And um, you may wonder who the homosexual is in this picture. <laughs> My, uh, my mother, who's a beautiful picture, she's got kind of like this Star Trek collar thing on. <clears throat> um, I am not sure how old I was, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not sure how old I was, but uh, I bring this picture. Uh, my mom passed away about three years ago, and she knew I was showing this picture, she'd be horrified. <laughs> um, but to get to understand a little bit about my work and me, it's always important that we share our stories who we are. We don't do it on the text message, we don't do it on the computer, we do it face to face and say, hey, how you doing? This is what I'm about. Because we'll find out that our differences bring us together and not divide us. So, my parents, um, what I want to share with you, not everything that you see on the outside is necessarily what was going on in the inside. And when I talk about hate and bigotry, I will tell you that I came from a, a fairly decent background, but I was also taught that it was okay to hate. Hate is learned in a family. Media also assists that with a lot of things that we're watching on TV, in our music, our video games, a lot of it, but hate is learned in a family. It's passed on by our parents. So, in retrospect about that, on a Sunday, we used to take a, a family Sunday drive. Did anybody do that on a Sunday? Take a kind of little drive with your family, kind of good. You know, the windows are down, you might go out and have a buffet, a little brunch thing. That's what we did. I came from a small town in Michigan of about 3,900 people, very small town. My father owned a hardware store. My mother worked at home, uh, did a variety of things, but took care of her two sons. One thing I want to share with you is my brother and I are both adopted. I'm going to show this cute little picture. I always did the smile in these photos. My brother and I are both adopted. My brother's two and a half years older than I. We're both adopted from different families, and does anybody want to guess, those of you who know me, you're not allowed to say, does anyone want to guess what number three is? What was that? 
we're both gay. My parents hit the homosexual lotto. <laughs> they didn't think so. So, my brother was the thin kid growing up, I was the chubby kid, and I was fat shamed most of my life. So much the fact my mother had mental and emotional issues that we didn't really figure out until later in life. My mother would take the Sears catalog model, male model, cut the head off, put it on the refrigerator, and cut my head off of a school picture and post it on the male model on the refrigerator door, and that's the way I was supposed to look before I went and grabbed my next dessert out of the freezer. Number one. Those sunny drives turned into a horrific affair that I figured out later on in life because I came from a predominantly white community. My dad would come home from the hardware store and tell inappropriate jokes about Jewish people, gay people, and not using the word gay, but the F word. Talk about the Latinos in our town in the black community. I've heard it all. I have heard every single joke. And if you're a child, and you hear those jokes, you get brainwashed because you were supposed to listen to your parents. They're the wise people that are bringing you up, and you get brainwashed when you hear it. On a Sunday drive, when the first black family moves into town, the Nettles family, when we take a drive, my dad would say, okay, son, this is what I want all of us to do. Roll up the car window and lock the door. What do you think that's gonna to tell to a child in the backseat of a car? We went down to a Tigers game in Detroit, and we'd be in an area that was really impoverished, and my dad said, sons, I want you to roll the car window and lock the door. So as you get older, you get this message in your head that what? Be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Live in fear. Black people, bad people. Bad people, they're gonna hurt you. The Mexicans, the Latinos, they're gonna hurt you, they're gonna wanna steal from you. That gets plugged in your head a lot. I knew for some reason, and I don't know the higher power or what, that that was not right. I accepted friends for who they were. I had overweight friends, I had skinny friends, I had friends that were uh, handicapped. I, they were my friends, I loved them, but they were not welcome into my home. I had to go over to their house. So that's the kind of the background that I was raised in. And uh, at times it was good, at times it wasn't. There was a whole lot of love in the house, and it's kind of funny, when I would turn 21, my mom said, Reggie, I don't know where you got to love people so much, but you sure didn't get it from this family. Yeah. Very sad. So that we're all on the same page here, this is the audience participation part. On the count of three, I want you to say, hate has no home here. One, two, three. Hate has no home. Perfect. Thank you. We're all on the same page with that. I agree that we're, we're in a really rough spot in our country where the message is going out that it's okay to hate. It's not. And you know what I'm talking about. We see a lot of swastikas up. We see a lot of people that are doing a lot of things to minorities and just people in general. It doesn't matter who you are, but hate seems to be running rampant. And we're not losing hope on that. But as people like you that are gathered this afternoon and can see and appreciate, we want a better community. So my question for you is, what kind of community do you want to live in, and what is your legacy going to be? So the first thing that we can do in combating, combating hate is to actually do something. In the face of hatred, apathy will be interpreted as acceptance by the perpetrators the public and worse, the victims. Community members must take action. If we don't, hate persists. And I will tell you how hate can be attacked. <coughs> the Westboro Baptist Church, I'm going to give a prime example of this, an extreme example of this. The Westboro Baptist Church facilitates a website called GodHatesFags.com. If you've not seen this website, go on and look at it. You won't be happy. So what they do is they'll come and pick it. And a lot of people don't know about this, but when you're fighting hate, these people will come into your community because they've heard maybe somebody that was community oriented or a service member that identified as LGBTQ or somebody that was influential that 
died from complications from AIDS. They're like, oh no, we're going to come into your community and pick it. Or if you're doing a play about something they think is identifying a gay person, um, they're going to come into your community and pick it and see all these awful things. They come into your community, and by the way, it's called a love crusade. So they come into the community, and, they, and, and, and it's people from the Westboro Baptist Church, the Phelps family, and they bring people in. Who do you think these children are? They're grandchildren. So when I talk about hate being learned in a family, this is being passed on down to this generation to tell them it's okay for you to hold a sign that says God hates fag enablers. These kids then go to school and they bully the kids that identify as LGBTQ. They may just bully anybody because they are being raised and taught by their family that it's okay to hate. That is not okay. So that love crusade comes into your community and you know how, they, how the Westboro Baptist Church funds their love crusade? They'll come into your community, somebody's going to be upset that they're there, they get threatened by somebody that can't handle all these picket signs, and they'll say something like, you know, Shirley Phelps, I'm going to come after you, or I'm going to punch you, or you all go to help, they'll be threatened. There's usually a policeman there, or a policewoman, they'll file a report, they'll sue them, they win the money in court, they fund the next love crusade to go to another community. It has nothing to do with the love of God or whoever you pray to. That is not love. And the Westboro Baptist Church is just the Phelps family. It's nobody else. So, that's a prime example. So what do you do to counteract that? Some people have come up with the idea to have different signs across the street from them. <laughs> which I think is freaking awesome. <laughs> Where's Waldo? You know, I've seen it all. Silly hats only, God hates flags. So yeah, you do it in a peaceful manner. I always say, do not even acknowledge that they're there. Because <clears throat> that's what they get fed up on. They like to work with people, psychology, you know, get in your heads, and then they motivate people, or they upset people. That's their way of doing things. So what happened in Topeka, Kansas, where the Westboro Baptist Church is, Aaron Jackson, <clears throat> a philanthropist, decided, you know what, there's a house for sale across from the Westboro Baptist Church. I'm going to buy it, call it the Equality House. And let's go here, I'm going to skip this for just a second here. So they're going to join forces, we're going to make the Equality House and put it right across from the Westboro Baptist Church. And he's going to make it a little bit of a museum inside, and they're going to have a garden out back. So if you visit it, and you feel like maybe picking a tomato out back, or you know you need some dip lettuce at home to celebrate equality or something, you can go in the back seat. I'm going to show you in the backyard. I'm going to show you how close this house is. <laughs> That's the West World. I love this. So, you are fighting hate with love. And Aaron Jackson, look his name up on the internet. He's quite an amazing guy. He's done a lot uh, for the community. He's done a lot just uh, in Africa and, and bringing people together and, and fighting for clean water and food. But uh, that house is still there. People visit it all the time. They, they actually had uh, somebody locally come and spray signs of hate and swastikas on the side and stuff, and they got repainted over with them big fanfare. Um, but my thing is this, when those people come to your community, make sure you call out your local newspaper and media. It's like, why is it okay for them to cover a news story about 30 Klansmen in New York City, but they're not covering uh, a news story about 300 doing a peaceful march in protest against that somewhere else? So make sure you call them out on that. Because, as, as I once told uh, in a news story, if it bleeds, it reads. People love reading about conflict. Look at our reality TV shows. We get caught up in our TV shows on TV, 
We have our devices, and if that doesn't even make it worse, <clears throat> we become the bully, the internet bully, is where you have people that pass pictures around, and my friends do it on the subway, of people wearing inappropriate clothes, or they go to Walmart and, and take pictures of people that are overweight wearing something, and they put it all over the internet for everybody to laugh at. Is that okay? Absolutely not. And we've taught our kids that that's funny, that's, that's an okay thing. Look at the, I mean seriously, look at the shows on TV. We have people tearing people apart, we have the housewives of whatever county. Um, we have the real world on TV still, uh, a, a lot of different shows. And, it, and it's pitting people against other people so we can get those ratings up. So some of the things that we can do, we gotta speak up. If you see indifference and injustice in your community, don't be complacent. Do something about it. Call out your leaders. Pressure your leaders to do something. And I'm talking about the mayor, your elected officials, the president of the college, the people that are big on business in your community. Pressure them and teach them. Don't just say, you've got to do something about this. Teach them about hate, the signs of hate, where hate and bias is in your community. If you're doing something like that now and teaching that and being better, that's awesome. But pay it forward and teach it to other people because I know all of you that are sitting here are looking for a better tomorrow. You're looking for answers on our current administration and why day after day it's something new and something hateful. People will listen to you. Do you think the cattle rancher in Michigan, or the police officer in North Dakota are not making a difference? They are. They're making a difference there because people are listening to them. It's not the Ellen DeGeneres, you know, Rosie O'Donnell, or, or Ricky Martin, or whoever it be. Those people are influential, but it's the people in our own communities, like the board here and other people as yourself, that are doing something. You may not be a public speaker, you may not be a TV star or whatever, but do it in your own way. And your own way is awesome. Writing a letter, vocalizing you know, who you are, inspiring other people. If you're in a relationship, LGBT relationship, you know, share that with other people, share that with young people. Young people need to see that there are validated relationships and our straight out allies. There's validated relationships and we accept you for who you are. And you gotta speak up about that. Lead is an example.